Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rudy Maté, University of Delaware, and I would first like to thank Sabine for inviting me and the Institute at large, of course, and all the people who have made this happen, and you for coming here in such great uh, and heartening numbers. Um, <clears throat> now, I'd like to start very briefly with a, a number of uh, dichotomies, uh, if you will, uh, perhaps not as eloquent as the one uh, Matt Miller just uh, pointed out, uh, but the kind of dichotomies that shows you the vibrancy of the culture, uh, the multiplicity of the culture, uh, and how the traditional and the modern, uh, quote unquote, uh, interact in Iran. The diversity, of course, is uh, very much visible in the uh, enormous diversity in, uh, in ethnicity and languages uh, and faith uh, in Iran. Uh, I'll let, let this all pass without comment because there's no time for that. Here are some of the sort of atmospheric uh, images that I'm showing to you, uh, all of which I took myself in um, the last few trips I made to Iran between 17 uh, and 19. Um, so uh, most of them speak for themselves, and they're quite random, and again, I won't comment on them because I will run out of time before uh, I get to the main topic here. Um, so north central Iran, Karshan, this is a rest stop uh, close to Tehran. Uh, where the food is a lot better than what you get in the United States, I can assure you. Uh, there's a famous mosque in Kaushan, lit at night. Uh, this is the famous Friday mosque in Esfahan. The women's section partitioned off, of course. Uh, but then this is domestic tourism, which has really picked up since the embargo under which Iran has been suffering. Uh, here we have a devotional image of women at a shrine. And here we have a woman who is, whatever she's doing, she's not... Uh, praying at a shrine. Uh, the Tehran Book Fair, ninth, Iran turns out to be the ninth country in the world in terms of book production. It's an enormously exhilarating annual event in Tehran. Thousands of publishers, uh, literally. Uh, and again, some snapshots of that uh, event. Uh, one of the big hits was, of course, uh, uh, Michelle Obama's uh, book in translation. Uh, Autism has a special section and, is, and gets attention in Iran all to militate against this notion that Iran is a dark and obscure country. Now, let me get to the real topic, which is the Safavids, in which uh, I am supposed to be a specialist. The Safavids are very important. This is, these are the contours of the country at the time. It runs, the, the dynasty really precedes uh, the year 1500 to 1501. It starts in the 14th century as a sort of a mystical order. It acquires uh, state dimensions in 1501, and it runs until 1722 when it dissolves under the onslaught of Afghan insurgents. So it's 220 years. Uh, and the Safavi period is extremely important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the shrine of the founder, the mystical uh, fellow. This is the interior of that. Uh, this man is the most consequential ruler uh, because Shah Ismail founded the state, founded the Safavid um, entity uh, as a state. Uh, he proclaimed 12 Shiism as state religion, turned it into a major faith and the majority faith in the country, and thus helped create overlapping territorial and religious boundaries that give Iran the contours of a national identity or proto-national identity in the form of a kind of particularism in the Middle East, indeed in the world that endures until today. Iran, after all, is the only majority uh, uh, Shi country in the world, not the majority, Iraq actually is, uh, together with Iran, but the, of the only country where uh, Shiism is uh, the official religion. So that's one reason. Um, and Safavid Iran, the other reason is that uh, Safavid Iran um, is seen, it occupies a special and even a unique place in the modern Iranian imagination because at least retrospectively from today's vantage point, it is seen as the last moment in Iranian history when the country and its people represented cultural splendor and projected power and stood tall against the world before colonialism, before the onslaught of the West. It's a very important point. I'll come back to that in my conclusion. All of this is reflected, of course, in the historical written record, but also in the material visual um, uh, evidence that still exists. Now, the quintessential figure here is this fellow, Shah Abbas, who ruled, he's men been mentioned before, 1688 to uh, 1629, 1588 to 1629, arguably the most formidable and most forward-looking forward uh, uh, ruler in all of Iranian history, who centralized the state, reorganized and strengthened his army, uh, won much of the territory previously lost back from the Ottomans, the main enemies. Uh, he chose a centrally located state of Esfahan, 
uh, as his new capital and created a new vibrant center where government, com commercial, and religious symbolism came together uh, and turned all of it into a hub uh, of trade. This was image of uh, the, the Royal Square in Isfahan, uh, late uh, 17th century, and this is how it still exists. It's one of the wonders of the world. If you ever have a chance to go, please do not hesitate. Now, he did so in part by re resettling thousands of Armenians um, known for their commercial and entrepreneurial acumen from their homeland in Armenia to uh, a newly built suburb of Isfahan where they received commercial privileges um, and a modicum of religious freedom and self-rule. He also secured trade uh, and travel. Uh, this is an image, of course, of uh, Nujulfa, the town, the suburb in question. Uh, he also um, um, secured trade and travel by making provincial governors responsible for security and theft in their domains. Uh, and he built a multitude of caravans rides. Traditionally, 999 are attributed to his name. It's probably exaggerated, but it makes the point. Uh, and this is uh, actually the sort of the hemispheric reach of the Armenian community operating out of New Julfa, all the way from London to Manila via um, um, uh, Yemen and, and, and Madras in, in India. Now, most importantly, and this already proves the point, he built a link to the Indian Ocean by asserting his sovereignty over the Persian Gulf. Literal, he established a new port named after himself, contested the Portuguese who had occupied the Isle of um, El Hormuz since the early 19th, uh, 16th century with the help of uh, English naval power. Uh, he invited European maritime companies, the East India companies of England and Holland, uh, to come conduct trade in his territory on his term, playing them off against one another, uh, in part to deprive the Ottomans from income from, uh, by stimulating the oceanic trade, mostly having to do with the silk trade originating in the north on the Caspian littoral, as you can see in this aerial picture, um, and um, uh, carrying it to uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, here's a view of the Dutch uh, um, factory in Bandar Abbas and, and the port, silk invoice found in The Hague. And this is kind of the hemispheric trade that he has helped, helped establish uh, coming out of uh, Iran. Now, Abbas, Shah Abbas and his successors did not neglect religion. They further so solidified and actually, you know, further strengthened the sense of cohesion by encouraging the pilgrimage to Iranian sites uh, that is Qom and Mashhad, other than the, the holy sites of Iraq, uh, let alone Mecca and Medina, in part to keep currency within the country. Uh, and you might say that the current ceremonies and rituals pertaining to um, uh, Twelver Shiism, such as the flagellation during Muharram, the, the commemoration of the death of uh, Imam Hussein, all go back and originate in the Safavid period, not necessarily under Shah Abbas, but certainly under his successors. Um, now, in some, uh, and here, you know, again, some pictures about sort of the, you know, the diplomatic reach uh, in Venice and France uh, and so forth, various ambassadors back and forth, in part to uh, isolate the, uh, uh, the Ottomans. Um, Abbas and his successors, um, or the Safavid period, I should say, uh, can in some clearly be seen as, uh, um, uh, or, or, or I should say modern Iran can be seen as having its origins in, in the Safavid period. And the glories of Isfahan uh, uh, definitely serve as living proof of that. Now, the, um, and here are some images of the shrine of Mashhad as it appears today, vibrant, extremely popular, uh, center of devotion. Um, and I'll come to my end of my talk because after the, 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 the fall of the Safavids in 722, under the onslaught uh, of a small number of insurgent Afghans who were nominally under the control of the uh, Safavids and their brief rule, Iran slid into de decentralization and part of the plateau really fell into chaos. And the 18th century is a dark and disturbed period uh, in the country. It's poorly documented. The only highlight, you might say, is Nadir Shah, a warlord who rose uh, in the uh, 1730s, he was assassinated in 1747, who uh, is a source of pride in a way because he pulled together the country together to some extent, but he can also he also fits very poorly into the image of Iran as a Pacific country because he raided India um, all the way to Delhi and robbed the peacock from that still the pride of Iran, uh, among other things. Um, Iran at the time, and this is really the point, became disconnected from the currents of world history with all of its innovations, political, uh, social, and technological developments, far more than, say, the Ottoman Empire next door and Mughal India 
uh, because of the British. In part, Iran, because Iran was effectively landlocked. Persian Gulf is not exactly the most propitious uh, entry uh, into uh, uh, towards the world. Now, when it reconnected in the 19th century, it did so, Iran, in conditions of growing dependency because, because the country quickly fell under the influence of the two most powerful neighbors, that is Russia and Britain operating out of India. It lost a lot of territory and saw its sovereignty severely undermined and compromised to the point of becoming a semi-colony. And you might say that the Iranians have been smarting ever since from this notion, and especially as of the 19th century when ancient pre-Islamic Iran ended up being rediscovered, so to speak, Persepolis, among other things, the grandeur and the true history of it, um, what we have seen is really uh, the, in the emergence of a new profile of the Safavids, uh, again, as a fondly remembered, a uh, proudly independent state, self-sufficient in its natural abundance, able to take uh, care of itself. The last time when Iran stood tall against the world. Culturally marked, not militarily defined, not imperialist, of course conveniently forgetting the incorporation and depredations of the Christian Southern Caucasus. That's a whole different topic, and that's not necessarily part of the self-image, uh, but still. Now, most if not all Iranians, exult in this version of some version of the Safavids uh, along those lines. Um, um, that, yeah, the, that is the idea of a lost and yet still tangible uh, glory. Both the monarchists uh, and the advocates of the current Islamic Republic, secularists as much as the faithful. The non-religious minded focus on the glories of Isfahan and the achievements of Shah Abbas, and they actually do blame religion up to a point as one factor in the weakening of the fall of the dynasty. I haven't really talked about it, but there was one image which I kind of glossed over. He's the kind of poster child, Mohammed Bakhin Majlisi, member of the high clergy, who uh, you know, is seen as sort of the incarnation of the dour and dogmatic uh, high clergy that influenced the later shahs and contributed to the downfall, the weakening, uh, the sapping of the energy uh, of, of the state. Now, Conversely, the religious minded in Iran today point to the very same cleric as a harbinger of a clerically inspired rule that the Ira Islamic Republic represents, ideally at least. And they may be allergic to the monarchy as Republicans or Islamic Republicans, but with Cyrus the Great, you know, pre-Islamic and Anushirvan, both emblems of eternal idea of justice in Iranian history, Shah Abbas looms simply too large to ignore and his achievements are too great to dismiss from a nationalist perspective. And it is for these and many other reasons I would argue that the Safavid period remains front and center in the modern Iranian imagination and its consciousness. Thank you.